on the Experts Connect podcast, we have thought-provoking conversations with top-performing experts on topics that matter to you. With Experts Connect, you'll uncover fascinating facts and gain the necessary skills you'll need to improve all aspects of your life. Today, we have Mernush Varat and Deepak Srinivasan with us, and they'll be talking to us about the Emergence Alliance project. Mernush, could you kindly introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. This is Mernush Varat. Uh, I am a data scientist in data science and AI elite team in IBM, and uh, I have background in data science with a PhD in the field. And I've been working with Deepak uh, during last year, around eight months, uh, on the emergent project that we want to explain to you. Um, yeah, so I am here with Deepak. Deepak, please go ahead. Hey, this is Deepak Srinivasan. I'm a developer uh, for AI applications with Arto Data Labs. Um, so we are the data science people within uh, Rolls Royce. So, um, and I've had the pleasure and the honor of working together with lots of interdisciplinary data scientists um, and not certainly not the least, <clears throat> some fantastic data scientists from IBM. Uh, Dan Bush was a colleague of mine uh, as in the context of Project Emergent. So I'm really looking forward to demonstrate a couple of tools that we've developed in the course of this project. I'm looking forward to a really interesting thought exchange here. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for sharing, guys. Marnoush, over to you. Okay, thanks a lot. As um, Deepak also mentioned, uh, IBM and Rolls Royce got together in Emergent Alliance, and we have been working in the last year as part of one team. Really great uh, data scientists from Rolls Royce and IBM got together. Uh, and uh, we have been working as part of this um, Emergent Alliance that is a non-for-profit -for organization um, and trying to address the challenges of COVID-19. So when uh, Emergent Alliance was established, many companies uh, joined this um, initiative like IBM, Rolls-Royce, Microsoft, Google, and many other companies to bring resources, data, technology uh, for um, coping with the challenges of COVID-19 through methods of data science. As part of this project, our aim was to supply governments with insight that can be used for supporting their decision-making of COVID-19 countermeasures. Uh, when we got together and scoped use cases, we quickly understood that for a full understanding of uh, the COVID-19 impact, we need to look not only uh, to the impact on the health uh, aspect, uh, but also look, uh, we, we need to look into the behavior and the sentiment of the population. And then we also looked at uh, how um, this impacted on the economy. So uh, building on these three main work streams, we worked uh, in many use cases. So here you can see how uh, the use cases that we developed are connected. Uh, for instance, uh, we have worked on several use cases around the health um, with blue color. Then uh, we analyzed how the health um, impacted the behavior and for instance, the policies that the government imposed. Um, on the top, you can see some use cases around the uh, mobility, the government measures, and how these impacted the uh, sentiment of the population by looking into the media and social media, and all how it impacted on the economy. For all of uh, these use cases, uh, we, uh, we built uh, pipelines in IBM Cloud Pipe for Data and using Cognos Analytics for develop, developing dashboards. And because we were dealing with dynamic data sources, and as we know, COVID data is changing every day, we needed to uh, build end-to-end -end pipeline that can um, ingest the daily data and uh, building uh, and updating the, um, the analysis pipeline and uh, 
improve the dashboards and update the dashboards. We also built um, some knowledge management tools to inform the users about the analysis of our um, uh, our use cases, for instance, building a chatbot or a data repository uh, and so on to uh, let the user know better about these results. So starting from uh, the health use cases, we try to understand how to assess the COVID risk in a regional level. We try to um, compose a predicted risk index that is uh, indicating the riskiness of um, regions um, in terms of the risk in uh, and health. And this is based on a short-term prediction uh, model. This work was extended um, by, uh, by clustering, uh, by building a, a special temporal clustering of uh, COVID disease spread and understanding what are the COVID, for instance, hot spots or cold spots within UK. Then we looked into uh, how governments are reacting, how they are imposing lockdown measures. Uh, and uh, for that, we, um, we detected clusters of COVID-19 lockdown measures uh, to see how different governments are reacting similarly and get a more comparative view. Um, in addition to all these, uh, we also built a library of scenarios and a data labeling tool that uh, gives the user uh, the chance to view all these data sources and understand better, label them for further analytics processes. Moving into the behavioral analysis, we try to understand how people change behavior and their sentiment during the pandemic. We focused on uh, the mobility, build a mobility estimator that predicts mobility for the next uh, nine days, given uh, a set of lockdown measures. We also looked into the airport restrictions and retrieved information on country specific regulations. And we, we built dashboards to inform the user uh, on, the, on this information. DPAC will show you a demo of that. Then uh, we looked into how the tourism industry uh, have been impacted, how people um, change behavior uh, regarding the tourism, also uh, how the sentiment uh, of the population have been impacted by looking into the news um, and media content, for instance, uh, understanding how the topics that are discussed in the media uh, have been changing over time or in social media, uh, understanding how people are uh, being affected on their mental health or their reactions toward vaccine. Uh, then uh, with all these, we try to also understand how and when uh, we will economically recover from COVID-19 by building an analytic model, uh, analytical model of the economy and looking into how different proxies um, have uh, can be translated to shock in um, COVID uh, to different industries and how this shock in, in a specific industry have been uh, propagated to, toward the whole industry. And we have built an app uh, that uh, we will show you a demo. So I'd like to show you just some examples of the dashboards that we have created. For instance, on the top, you can see screenshots of our emergent risk index dashboard. Uh, the user can select the region, a country, and in regional level, uh, can see the risk of um, COVID-19 to health by color. Also, we can see uh, how is the risk in a short-term uh, prediction interval. And uh, on the right, you can see the, the prediction model showing also the, the most important factors uh, that, are, um, that are considered in this prediction model. And on the bottom, uh, we can see how severe um, the government measures were. Uh, for instance, on the left by color, uh, we can see this, the stringency measures shown by color. Um, and on the right, the, the the clusters of these COVID um, measures and lockdown measures um, in, for different countries. For instance, the user can select a specific country like France and can see how, um, how 
similar countries uh, to France um, have been reacting by seeing also the cluster states over time. On the top here, you can see uh, our news analysis dashboard showing the topics and sentiments um, um, of different topics uh, over time. For instance, uh, we can see, we can select the topic like COVID and see um, the, the subtopics of uh, COVID and how uh, these subtopics um, in terms of frequency and sentiment have changed over time. And um, the bottom, then uh, we can see some examples of the uh, uh, co uh, country restriction dashboard and the Airbnb uh, travel sentiment dashboard. So I'd like to pass to Deepak for the demo of the E3 and our travel restriction dashboard. Thank you, Manush. That was, that was a fantastic introduction. Um, as Manush mentioned, um, I would just like to demonstrate a couple of tools, um, what we developed in the context of Project Emergent. I think some of these tools could be very useful for people uh, like uh, government, um, public servants, government leaders, business leaders, policy makers to understand the impact of COVID on our economy. And that's the first tool that, that I'll start with. So this is a tool that we call E3, Emergent Economic Engine. So this is a tool that allows you to um, understand the impact of a shock, um, that's a decrease on economic activity on the economic output of a country. Because one of the most common pictures of the economy, like a mental model, if you will, of the economy that you can have, um, is that you can consider an economy as a system into which um, you've got resources and activity that, that flow in. And as an output is what you get so-called economic output. And because as we know, um, due to um, COVID-19 uh, COVID and the uh, ensuing health scenario, uh, many governments or almost all governments across the world had to introduce non-pharmaceutical interventions, lockdown, so to speak, um, which severely curtailed uh, people's activities, um, certainly economic activities. I mean, we all have seen how uh, tourism and restaurant and service activities have been very severely affected. So this tool will give you um, uh, give you a mechanism or it will, it will, it will it's, it's, it's a tool that empowers you to understand how the economic shock will uh, depress the economic output. Um, so on top of the tool, um, <clears throat> so the tool is presented as a web front end, that is to say you can just access it over a browser. So we found that it works quite well with Firefox, uh, Edge um, or with Chrome. Um, and this is a URL of the tool. This is something that you can also um, find out directly from the Emergent Alliance homepage, where we made um, a few of your few of our uh, freemium or a few of our uh, freebie products available. So the Emergent Economic Engine here. So you click on that, go to the tool, and <clears throat> the tool is structured so such, such that on the left hand side is where you, as the user, um, as, as as a business leader or, or as a government. Uh, employee or as a as, as, as member of informed public, you can state your inputs where you can give your inputs to the system, to the, to, to, to the tool. Right? Um, so you can choose the country. So uh, as, as an example, I'm just choosing UK and I'm choosing the shock. Um, so for me, a shock is a good proxy or, or a good indicator for uh, economic activity that gets curtailed due to lockdown related measures. right? Um, so I assume that uh, I would like the simulation to go on for two years. So I'd like to predict how the economy is going to evolve or how much the economy is going to contract for next two years. And I would like the shock of the economic um, economic impact to propagate um, downstream. So an economic network is like a graph where you've got different economic activities that feed off each other. And we just assume that the economic activity that goes to the end user propagates downstream, just like a river. Right? And we assume that the economy also has a shock of 20% at the beginning. This is a number that I could get, for example, uh, by looking at economic literature surveys and research, uh, by researching the economic activity uh, surveys from the British government or from economic analytics or economic intelligence agencies. And I assume that the shock goes on from the beginning of 2000, or from the March 2020, which is when uh, I think March 9, 2020 was the date when COVID-19 was recognized as pandemic, uh, till December 2020. So for the calendar year of 2020. So 
I just give these as the inputs to my simulation engine. And what I get there as an output is the graph uh, that kind of gives you an indication of how much the economic activity gets depressed or how much of the economic output gets depressed, right? So here, for example, I see that the accommodation and food service industry, without knowing any further, um, it, it, it decreases by a certain amount and as well the other industries as well. And it's quite interesting because you are able to see um, the overall output change um, due to this particular shock profile, if you will, and that is of the order of 15% um, over, over two to three years. So we are talking about like five to six percent economic output contraction for about a year, for the next two to three years, right? And with this tool, we've also made um, available a provision where you can model a recovery strategy. Because as you may have noticed in the press, um, you've got governments and you've got, um, you've got states and countries that pump in money into the economy uh, with the aim of stimulating economic growth. And that is something that we can also use in the tool. And I just assume that, um, let's say the British government, again, it's just a toy example, um, that the British government gives an economy-wide stimulus um, of, let's say, uh, of the order of five or seven percent of the overall economy. And then you can kind of see how things get a bit better, because initially the economy would have gotten at the end of 2020, uh, would have gotten suppressed, the economic output would have gotten suppressed by 12%. So we're talking about an economic output contraction of 12% without the stimulus measures. But a stimulus measure of the order of 7% uh, would kind of um, ameliorate the situation. It would make the situation from becoming uh, less extreme uh, by arresting the economic output contraction. So the economic output contraction is not of the order of 12%, but it's something like 8.5 to 9%. Um, again, I would like to emphasize that in this tool, um, we made quite a bit of assumptions. For example, we, um, we uh, do not really consider um, some of the high frequency economic activities that could change uh, some of the economic dynamics here. So we've made quite a few assumptions here. Um, the objective of the tool is to give you some sort of like an indication. It's to give you some sort of like a bound, if you will, for economic output contraction. Uh, but all the same, it's quite useful because you could kind of use it to um, find out what the worst case economic output contraction could be. Um, so that way, I think this is a pretty useful tool if, uh, if you're looking to find out a um, little bit of like a forecasting, approximate forecasting of economic output contraction. Um, the next tool that I would like to uh, kind of quickly demo is uh, the Tablet Restriction Dashboard. Uh, again, um, the uh, ensuing um, lockdown measures um, have caused uh, the tourism and the travel industry to take quite a hit. I mean, we've all seen uh, cancelled bookings and hotels and, 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 and flights that have not happened or vacations that have been cancelled and so on, right? or even business travel that has not happened that much. Um, so with this dashboard, um, again, tourism industry or again, policy makers or business leaders could, could find out um, how is it that reciprocal travel is possible. So again, to take the example, so if you consider Germany here, which is what I've done, um, as of um, end of 2021, the 29th of, Jan the 29th of January 2021, um, with this dashboard, you can find out from which countries could you enter Germany without any problem. So for example, um, you could see that you are allowed to enter to Germany from Australia, for example. And some of the countries um, where there might be some restrictions are indicated by um, yellow or amber. So these could indicate that you know, there are some restrictions in place, but it depends on a case by case basis. So that's actually valid for most of the countries in the world. Um, so you could see um, Australia and New Zealand, for example, and, and, and probably Japan as well, uh, they could enter into Germany uh, without any problem or without much of a hazard. And it, the, the, the second part of the dashboard also gives you the other picture. It, it tells you which are the countries you're allowed to travel to or fly to from Germany. So it becomes very clear that it becomes very hard or actually it's impossible, I would say, not allowed to enter the selected country. I would say. So it is actually quite, it was actually quite hard at the end of Jan to uh, fly from Germany to Japan. Um, or, or, uh, and again, again here, the amber or the yellow ones mean that there are some restrictions in Depends on a case by case basis, which is most of the European Union countries. And the interesting part of, uh, of having such a dashboard, of programming such a dashboard, is that you could have the notion of the time. 
So you could find out how the travel restrictions evolve with time. Um, and that is a common thread, I think, that unites both of these simulation products, uh, the economic engine, uh, emergent economic engine, and travel restrictions dashboard, is that you've got notions of both temporal dynamics, that is how the uh, lockdown and, and affects the economy or the travel, freedom of travel movement uh, across time, um, and as well across space. So how is it that, you know, the different countries are kind of talking to each other or interacting with each other across both geographical and across temporal that is to say, time regions. I think with that, I think I'm done with my demo and I would like to pass it on back to you again, Manoj. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Deepak, for the really great description of the dashboard and the tool. I'm going to uh, show you another tool that is developed uh, in our project and available on the Emergent website as well. This is called Cookie Cutter, that is a combination of several tools. Uh, you, you can you can have a look at different tabs here and uh, see what is uh, shown. So the uh, aim of the cookie cutter is to present um, health data and also economic data from many resources and uh, in various countries. So we can have uh, we can select a source and a country and then present um, different dashboards here. And the first one is the um, is the health indices and the COVID infections. We can see the waves in Germany. This is followed by the stringency index that is representing the government lockdown measures, and um, also showing these uh, lockdown measures more in detail. For instance, um, the measures in school closing or workplace closing, and so on. And then we also added um, uh, some dashboards from our analysis, like the clustering uh, of the lockdown measures, how the countries have gone through different processes, and also a, a very um, nice work of Damia Severin uh, on fitting on the distributions here. For instance, you can see uh, how uh, a, a wave is um, is uh, separated or is um, basically um, represented in several um, subways. And the, uh, the point of um, the cookie cutter is that it, it uh, gives the possibility to the user uh, to um, present the data, to, um, to have a good view and a comparative view on different data sets, and also to um, to label them. So, uh, as mathematically, it can be hard to, for instance, uh, label uh, the first wave or second wave or a conflict uh, of the COVID. Uh, here, we give the chance to the user to label them and then save this labeling data as wave or call and then um, use it for further machine learning um, analysis. And similarly, we have also uh, here COVID, um, uh, the economic uh, data and uh, different proxies that um, the user can select and then also label as um, shock or recovery and save it for further analysis. This work is, um, is developed by Klaus Paul in our project and uh, yeah, this uh, gives a really good view on different data sets and um, help data scientists for uh, going further on their work. Um, so what we have achieved so far, as we showed you a, a kind of high level with, um, with more details on the demos of the dashboards that uh, are launched already um, on the Emergent website. Um, this work, um, and we have uh, we had the chance actually to to use some technologies and especially IBM Cloud Tech for Data and uh, Cognos Analytics that helped us to accelerate the data science development and also um, it um, it facilitated the, the collaboration between the different data science teams within Emergent Alliance. Uh, many of these dashboards that we showed you are already built on end-to-end -end pipeline. 
and um, can be extended further with different data sources or, for instance, when the governments need to, need to uh, tune these models to their needs or to, to their uh, regional level, that can be easily done. The code is entirely published on GitHub. Uh, is open source and part of these tools, as uh, as we showed you, are already uh, available for public use. Um, and you can see, uh, you can go to this website, the Emergent website, and use these tools. Also, um, Emergent is open for different companies, um, researchers, uh, individuals to come and help to, um, to volunteer. And uh, we uh, basically, we, we are working as um, a kind of volunteer basis um, to, um, to uh, use data science methods and understand better what's happening in the past and uh, address better the challenges that are facing us in post-COVID world. Uh, so you can also have a look at the website and see how to become a member um yeah i encourage you uh, to have a look at that also the, uh, we have um uh, published a lot of tech blogs um showing uh, the data science methods and all the technical um parts of our work are described in these uh, tech blogs you can access them uh, in the on the emergent website and learn more about the underlying models uh, there have been a lot of uh, people from IBM and Rolls-Royce and also individuals have uh, participated in our project uh, from um, sponsors and managers, um, the IBM data science team and Rolls-Royce data science team that work really in an excellent way uh, with each other. And also we had really wonderful project managers that without their help, this work wouldn't be uh, possible. So I uh, finish my presentation here. Thank you so much. So guys, I have a few burning questions and whoever wants to answer can go first. What stories can you tell with the data you have gathered or processed during the Emergence Alliance project? I think for me, <clears throat> when you say like stories, I mean, I think what I have found is that it's not the individual pieces that count. It's not that we have like an individual, like a very powerful story that we, that, that we would like to market, but it's just lots of small bits that come together quite nicely. So I would almost visualize it as some sort of like a Lego bricks uh, or like Lego blocks, you know, the famous ones that kids play. Um, each Lego doesn't, doesn't look that impressive, but when you, Put together, and then when you when you kind of build a house, that's how I see it. Um, so each bit of the emergent project has uh, each bit of work that you know that that, that Marlo showed, or that some of my other fantastic colleague, colleagues have done, not only from IBM, but Rolls Royce, but also other companies, individuals, and so on. Um, it all fits very nicely um, in, into the final canvas. And actually, the the final thing, the whole, is some of is, is more than the sum of its parts, if you know what I mean. So in some sense, the name Project Emergent is quite suitable or apt because it really is emergent. So that is, that is something emergent that came out of it, you know, and we just put all of the individual things together. Um, so that to me is a big thing. So if you ask me what story would I like to say, maybe just it's always that the sum is always greater than the parts. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing. And one question that came to mind as I also played along with the tools on your website was, who exactly are your target users? A really good question. So um, the main users, I would say, uh, or at least we hope, uh, are the governments and local authorities. Uh, because we have designed all these tools and uh, solutions to help them to decide better. So um, again, um, when we say governments um, and authorities, then, um, then we should also define the end user, which I, I can categorize in two groups. One is this, uh, the specialists and experts, for instance, uh, the uh, tool that um, Deepak showed you 
on the economic engine, that's uh, definitely for uh, economists and the experts within the government to use this tool to uh, build further and use it for um, uh, more expert decisions. But also we have tools that the end user can be the general public, for instance, the travel restriction dashboard. Any Anybody can understand and use it for their even the daily decision making. So, yeah. That's Great. And I just want to quickly follow up on that question. So you mentioned the general user. But I was wondering, how do you make it more understandable for the layman to understand the data that you are presenting before them? Uh, so I, I, um, I will share my point of view and also I like uh, BPAC to share. Um, so in my eyes, uh, when, when we address the user's needs, we, we need to get constantly their feedback to improve yeah. our, our tools and tune to their needs. Uh, and that's um, the, the way that we are proceeding is, uh, is to launch these tools for public so they can first access and then uh, hopefully they come back to us with feedback. Yeah, um, yeah so that's, uh, that's the way that we have uh, thought about and would like to happen. Yeah. Very good. Deepak, do you have anything to say about this? Uh, actually, Mayanus just make a pretty good point. I can just extend it a little bit further. Um, so I think what the current COVID situation has shown is that, that there is increased awareness among the public for data. Yeah. Um, just as a personal anecdote, I mean, um, I mean, uh, my parents or my family members who are not exactly that much into data science or into software, uh, I think they have an increased understanding of data. And you have politicians across the world, for example, uh, that come on television and try to explain why R0 is so important and what why exponential curve really matters. So, you know, you've got phrases like flattening the curve and you know, exponential curve and so on. So people, I think people have, the, even the general public, um, even the non-mathematically inclined general public, if I may use the term, yeah. um, has become quite aware of, of, of data and, and, the, and the importance of data in today's world. So that's one. And in that, on that related note, I would encourage as well members of the general public uh, who may not be um, economists or uh, computer scientists or data analysts, doesn't matter. Uh, I would really encourage them to also have a little bit of like a playful approach towards data science, because sometimes you do make good discoveries or you do get some very interesting insights by just playing around with data. Um, and so that gives you some interesting insights into data that you would have never thought possible. So I would actually encourage everyone to play around with our tools, uh, try to break it a bit in a positive way, of course, and, and just you know, and then just try to broaden their horizons or, or, or share with us any interesting insights that they are finding. Yeah. Beautiful, thank you. And one question with, and these are questions that came to me as I was playing around with your tool. I think it was the travel restrictions one. Um, how often is this data updated? I think it's almost on a daily basis. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's almost on a daily basis, yeah. In as much as the current data becomes available, uh, once in a while you do have outages uh, due to computer system failures and, and you know, some websites not accessible or not. Uh, but it's, it's we try to keep it up, up to date as much as possible. Okay, great. And what have you learned from applying analytics with open data sets? I think, again, a couple of things which are again a little bit related to the points that I mentioned before. Um, um, one is, I think you need to be really, um, you need to really approach um, such, a, such a problem with a diverse interdisciplinary group of people. Um, so that you bring the widest and most diverse and, and the broadest possible perspective into the data set so that you know you don't become an echo chamber uh, you kind of you know you, you, the, 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 you have like almost like a tunnel vision if you know what i mean so it's, i think it's absolutely important that that a team of data scientists uh, that looks at data of such scope and magnitude to be as broad as interdisciplinary and to be as diverse as possible and they 
mean uh, also diversity with respect to uh, race, age, sex, ethnicity, training, backgrounds, and experience and all. And, and the second thing that, that, that you also notice quite a bit is um, you need to, either you have a particular hypothesis that, that you would like the data to answer, uh, but failing that it's absolutely important uh, to have a really inquisitive mind um, and to be perfectly willing to take criticism um, and to really encourage and critical group think um, so that you know so that you just don't uh, to bend the data to tell the story that you wanted to tell but you kind of have um, have a broad, broad overall global view of the data impressive i'm seeing a lot of design thinking aspects being enveloped in in your process very good and miranush i have a question for you what process do you take for validating your solutions? Very good question. So uh, for validation, in, when we apply data science methods, um, they, depending on the method, we have also validation techniques. For instance, if it's a prediction, then we try to see how the model um, is performing on a set of uh, data that is not seen to the model. For instance, if it's happening in the future, to see how closely it gets to the real outcome. Or for instance, if it's clustering, we would see um, some coherence metrics, how these clusters are well uh, separated and are representing um, like reasonably what, yeah, what if they are matching our expectation. Uh, but also, in addition to all these scientific methods, it's also important to uh, get validation from the, the expert communities. For example, what we did uh, in most of these use cases, if we could find experts and uh, independent, for instance, researchers from universities uh, in, this, in similar fields, we would um, reach out to them, ask them to review our work and um, tell us their expert opinion. And then uh, we would validate or and improve further. And another validation that is uh, very important is to validate with users. So how are these uh, are actually being used? How they, are, they can be improved to um to address the pain points of the users better how how we can uh, improve them further and for that uh, we took these steps to launch for instance uh, these uh, dashboards and the tools for uh, reaching to the users uh, better also we have been working with some uh, governments some local authorities in the uk uh, to collaborate with them and um, have regular meetings with them to uh, develop um, in a way that it addresses their pain points. So these are uh, more or less the approaches that we have taken so far. Okay, that's that's very good. And would you say that you have been integrating users from the onset of your process? Um, so uh, can you elaborate? You okay, so normally when you're designing something, because I'm coming from a design perspective here, so you normally start with your target user what and asking them what are their pain points, what is it that they want, you observe them, etc. COVID has presented us with a lot of information that you have been gathering along with your collaborators. So have you been meeting with the users, getting the information from them, maybe via social media, however However you choose to collect it from the onset of your process in the Emergence Alliance project. Yeah, so uh, we have actually done this uh, process in two ways. One is that when uh, we have the users available, for instance, we are, if we are working with, them, with government specialists or um, some local authorities, we involve them in design thinking workshops. So from the beginning, uh, we design the use cases with them, with the stakeholders, to see what are the uh, who are the end users, what are their pain points, what are the needs, um, and then go further with um, validating the data requirements and formulating the hypothesis. So uh, through uh, 
um, they, uh, I would say through design thinking workshop, that's that's really something that um, can clear up uh, what the users uh, would look for. But um, another approach is that, for example, for some use cases, we didn't have this uh, level. We didn't have the users available. Then we would uh, implement feedback loops. For instance, in a chatbot that we have developed, uh, we are um, giving the information to the user, but also asking them their feedback, uh, giving them a way that they can reach us. Um, that, that goes with more, I would say, general public that uh, uh, we, we didn't, um, let's say, we didn't reach out to them directly, but this is a way that we are collecting feedback. Yes, thank you so much for sharing. And Deepak, I have a question for you. So what are the other applications of macroeconomic simulations post COVID-19? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, so, I'm thinking of things like technological shocks. For example, there is an increasing realization um, across, again, governments and, and countries that the post-COVID world will, will or needs to look a little bit different from what it was before. We're talking about a sustainable future, um, more environmentally sustainable alternatives and so on. I think these, these changes uh, could also potentially be modeled as as a, as, a, as a shock, as a macroeconomic shock formulation tool, because what we are talking about is um, is the rewiring of parts of the economy, and that is something that we can potentially model with such a tool. And on a related note, again, um, I think also uh, large scale structural changes, for example, in the economy, uh, due to perhaps due to sudden regulation of the markets. Um, is also something that could potentially be uh, analyzed by such tool. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm really impressed with the work that you guys are doing. Wow. And how can people get involved in the Emergence Alliance project? Um, so that's, um, that's possible through Emergent website. Um, there is a tab for it. Uh, any anybody can go there, uh, register, uh, and give some contact information. Uh, and then emergent would um, go through those and then contact uh, the individuals or businesses, companies, researchers, universities. It's all is open to for collaboration really to all. Um, and then uh, emergent would uh, would reach out to them to see what is their interest or where they want to really collaborate. Is it, for instance, if it's a data scientist, then we would see uh, what is their point of interest and what is their background to get the best uh, benefit from it. And then um, uh, they would be assigned to a project that they are interested to work with. So that's the, yeah, that's the process that uh, individuals can take to collaborate with Emergent Alliance. Great. Do you have to be a data scientist to be involved in this project? No, not necessarily. We, uh, I, I think Emergent is looking for many backgrounds. Um, like, for instance, some individuals have joined us as a Scrum Master, as project managers, um, as a marketing, for instance, specialists um, or communication. So, um, no, really, uh, I would encourage everyone who has any interest to um, to help the society to recover from COVID-19 to join and we see how we can collaborate the best with each other. Okay, thanks for sharing, Marinoush. So thanks for sharing this enlightening information, Marinoush and Deepak. I was really, really impressed by the work that you guys have been doing on the Emergent Alliance project. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. And please don't hesitate to reach us for any further information. Okay. Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome. Thanks for tuning in on Experts Connect please head on over to teachsomebody.com and give us an applause. 
you may share your comments and ask your questions in the comment section. Please subscribe to us on YouTube as well as follow us on Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts. You can also follow me on Instagram at Davis Owusu. Have a lovely rest of the week. Bye.